In the windswept canyons of the American West, history is written in the sand. There are secrets buried here, clues to a time in the remote past when the land was very different, a time when the continent was young. North America was the real Jurassic Park. Western North America, 68 million years ago. Prehistoric Montana bears little resemblance to today. As far as the eye can see, a lush green forest dominates the plains. Nourished by seasonal rains, carpets of ferns mingle with evergreens in the shade of a dusky swamp. Temperatures are constant around the mid-70s, and the humidity is high. These conditions create the perfect environment for the evolution of the most sophisticated and bizarre group of dinosaurs the world has ever seen. Among the trees and shrubs, hundreds of species fight for survival in a brutal primeval world. From this mosaic of ancient life, one creature would emerge, king of the jungle. It was the most terrifying and fearsome beast to have ever stalked the earth. A mighty roar sends a chill through the forest. The ground shakes, and every creature within shouting distance runs for cover. Tyrannosaurus rex is master of all it surveys. Today, something is wrong. One T-Rex is having a bad day. Dazed and confused, it staggers through the woods, looking for water and safety. Tearing through the trees, it collapses on the banks of a river. But this T-Rex picked the wrong time and place to take a water break. As it sprawls across the warm sand, a flash flood roars downstream, engulfing the unwary dinosaur. Despite a final breathless struggle to escape, it drowns and is buried in sediment. Over the next 68 million years, the scene of this tragedy would undergo a series of dramatic, earth-wrenching changes. What was once the lush domain of the dinosaurs is now the arid badlands of Montana. But T-Rex wasn't the only creature that died here. The area around Fort Peck is littered with the bones of the last great dinosaurs to walk the earth. Preparing to head out once more into these primeval killing fields is dinosaur hunter Keith Rigby of Notre Dame University in Indiana. Okay guys, let's get the, the truck loaded. T-Rex is probably the world's most famous dinosaur, yet it's only found in North America. Its mystique is enhanced by its rarity. Since the first Tyrannosaur was discovered, not far from here, in 1905, only 19 others have been unearthed. Then in the summer of 1997, Rigby and his team made what may be the most important find of them all. Driving back to the site, Keith remembers the moment he first realized they were onto something big. They had two 
toe bones. They had uh, nearly a complete hand of a tyrannosaur. Things that could not be confused with any other kind of dinosaur. And they were big. Perhaps the biggest ever, Rigby's T-Rex is an incredible 65 feet long. And to see this specimen in the ground with six and eight inch teeth glistening, shiny, cold black against these uh, rather drab sandstones, there's an exhilaration that goes through you, the likes of which I've, I've never experienced before. I guess it must be like winning the Academy Award for a particularly good acting performance. This is the first thing we found. The claws knew we had a carnivorous dinosaur. The finger bones meant that this claw goes with a finger of a hand, perhaps of a T-Rex, but we knew it was T-Rex when we found the foot bones with a telltale dimple of such a large carnivorous dinosaur. Then we really got excited. Tyrannosaurus rex, meaning terrible lizard, roamed North America 65 to 70 million years ago. An average of 50 feet long and weighing six tons, it was the height of a two-story building. With a top speed of 20 miles an hour, T-Rex was the ultimate predator. Further digging uncovered more fragments. Buried in the sediment of an ancient river, they hinted that the dinosaur probably drowned. The dinosaurs, if they were feeling poorly or were critically wounded, would perhaps migrate to water, as many large uh, mammals do today. The elephants migrating to water during times of stress. It's not just the size of Rigby's T-Rex that's generating excitement. Eventually, his team unearthed two more tyrannosaurs, one adult and one juvenile. Scientists long thought the T-Rex was a solitary creature that lived and hunted on its own. But the discovery of a group buried together suggests he may have been a family man. There may have been a social structure when an injured individual was in fact cared for, fed, or provided sustenance uh, on, by its siblings or whatever its social group was, because it certainly could not have survived alone. Here it is, the smallest of the bones in the foot of Tyrannosaurus rex. Has three toes. This is the smallest of the ends of the digits of a very large carnivore. Imagine this. This of a 45 to 50 foot long animal, 20 to 25 feet tall, mean and nasty, and could have anything it wanted for lunch. of three geologic time periods that make up the Mesozoic, the age of reptiles. The first was the Triassic, 245 million years ago. The second was the Jurassic, which began 205 million years ago. It's the Jurassic period in North America that would make dinosaurs famous. In the 19th century, most of the continent was still untamed and unexplored. Dinosaurs were almost unheard of, but things were about to change. In 1877, a chance discovery would launch the great American bone rush and ignite the bitterest feud in the history of paleontology. Edward Cope of Philadelphia was brilliant and greedy. He wanted fame and fossils. 
His rival, O.C. Marsh, was also ambitious and rich enough to pay for what he wanted. Their battle centered on a site called Como Bluff in Wyoming, where rocks are exposed dating back to the Jurassic period. Like his 19th century predecessors, modern day fossil hunter and maverick scientist Bob Baker still prospects for dinosaurs in the rocks of Como Bluff. For him, this is the real Jurassic Park. Como Bluff is the spot where the first complete skeletons of Jurassic giants were found, not one or two, but dozens. And they were first found not by scientists, but by two guys working for the railroad. The men sent a message describing their discovery to Marsh at Yale University. Marsh immediately sent a check for $75 and a team to help them excavate. Marsh's people had already been here two years. They had already dug up 30 or more skeletons. They had giant plant-eating dinosaurs. What they did not have was a giant meat-eater. No one did. In the summer of 1879, Cope's men snuck into Como Bluff hoping to beat Marsh in the race to discover the first meat eater. There they hit the jackpot, a complete skeleton of the tyrant of the Jurassic, Allosaurus. Marsh's men never knew who was there and what was taken. All they saw was the great big hole. And in those boxes was the first complete skeleton of a giant meat-eating dinosaur ever found anywhere in the world and it went to Philadelphia. It was rustled. The discovery made headlines. Marsh vented his anger in the press. Now the battle for the bones would be fought on the front page as the two competitors vied to discredit each other. Despite their feud, Cope and Marsh left science an amazing legacy. During their intense 25-year rivalry, they unveiled 176 new species of dinosaurs, including famous names such as Apatosaurus, Stegosaurus, and Diplodocus. Cope and Marsh had unleashed a horde of awesome creatures on an unsuspecting world. Now the scene was set for the true story of the dinosaurs to really take off. This is the Morrison Formation, one of the most spectacular rock deposits on Earth. A thousand feet deep and 150 million years old, it dates back to the Jurassic period when dinosaurs ruled North America. Today, it's the largest dinosaur graveyard in the world. Stretching 1,200 miles north from New Mexico to Canada and 700 miles east from Idaho to Nebraska, these ancient rocks expose the secrets of a time when the Earth as we know it didn't exist. Long before dinosaurs first appeared, all the continents were joined together in one giant landmass called Pangaea. Then during the Jurassic period, a series of huge faults opened up in the Earth's crust, dividing Pangaea in two. Situated above the equator, North America became part of a new continent called Laurasia. But it was still unrecognizable. California lay underwater and was as far north as Alaska today. There was vol there are volcanoes, the uh, classic volcanoes that uh, dotted the landscape, uh, clouds of volcanic dust. By and large, the climates were rather dry. Dinosaurs have been found as far east as New Jersey, but only in the west are the rocks a time capsule of the Jurassic. They reveal that 150 million years ago, the Rockies had yet to form, and the land was mainly flat. Streams of seasonal rivers fed a forest of lush vegetation 
while in the distance, volcanoes spewed gas and dust into the dinosaur's world. In the spring, flash floods were common. Rumbles in the Earth's crust caused swells and basins. Riverbanks were swept away, and the plains engulfed in water. Out of this alien landscape emerged a breathtaking assortment of plant-eating dinosaurs. The weirdest was Stegosaurus. Its name means spiked lizard, after the big bony plates that jutted out of its back from head to tail. 30 feet long and weighing four tons, Stegosaurus was the size of a bus, which made it the largest armored dinosaur that ever lived. Its arsenal of weapons was the ultimate self-defense. 17 diamond-shaped plates, each one two feet tall, culminated in a blistering array of prickly spikes. Stegosaurus was one of the uh, real spectacular dinosaurs. It had these large, sharp plates running down its back in two rows of alternating plates, and these spikes extended horizontally and back off its tail. The animal was probably pretty much left alone. It could use its tail as a very effective defensive feature, swinging the tail at the attacking medium dinosaur. Stegosaurus is one of the best known dinosaurs in the world. But one feature still puzzles scientists. Its brain was no larger than a walnut. How did an animal so big get by on so little? What some lacked in smarts, others made up for in size. They were the sauropods, the superstars of the Jurassic, the largest creatures ever to walk the land. plant eaters that were over 100 feet long. Some sauropods were also as tall as a five-story building. Long-tailed and long-necked, they were eating machines that could graze either high or low. The sauropods were the dominant animals in the late Jurassic. And as the dominant animals, the plant dominant planting animals specifically, they were a very important food source for the large predators. Thus, these animals had to have important ways and, and efficient ways to defend themselves. Large body size is very important. One sauropod that left an unforgettable imprint on the Jurassic was Diplodocus, meaning double beam, because of its equally long tail and neck. Diplodocus was almost 90 feet long, over 40 feet tall, and weighed 12 tons. But its huge tapering tail, almost half the length of its body, was Diplodocus's most intriguing feature. Much of that tail was of no uh, apparent use for walking or other behaviors, but because of the long sinuous nature, it is thought that perhaps that they could crack that thing like a bullwhip against the side of an animal attacking them and defend themselves in that way as well. In the high-tech world of the Microsoft Corporation near Seattle, Washington, dinosaurs seem out of place. But chief technology officer and dinosaur fanatic Nathan Mervold finds Diplodocus irresistible. Whatever its tail was used for, he thought he could prove it using a computer. With computers, we can simulate the bodies of these dinosaurs and get very accurate simulations of what they would have worked like. The simulation of the tail uncovered a startling possibility. One of the most intriguing aspects that got me interested was the notion that these tails might have acted like a whip. Nathan made the groundbreaking discovery that Diplodocus's tail could travel faster than the speed of sound. Pow, it makes a crack. When it makes one of these supersonic cracks, it's going about Mach 2, about 12, 1300 miles per hour. When people talk about supersonic, they think of the Concorde or an F-16 or something like this. And so it, the first reaction is, well, of course, it's absurd that a, a tail of a 
dinosaur can go faster than the speed of sound. How could that be? An ordinary bullwhip will go faster than the speed of sound. If cow hide is strong enough, well, why not dinosaur hide? When Nathan looked at the tailbones of several sauropods, he found the same 10 vertebrae fused together. I believe it's because they use their tails like whips. If you talk to whip makers, you say, where do whips wear out first? It's where you go from the stiff area here to, to the first part that's flexible. There's a tremendous amount of uh, stress that generates here. This is where a whip wears out. That's where the dinosaurs had their bone fusion. A tail faster than the speed of sound made Diplodocus a creature to contend with. But why would an animal weighing 12 tons need such a weapon? Lurking in the forest was a killer that knew no fear. 148 million years ago in North America, it would commit one of the most diabolical acts of carnage the dinosaurs would ever see. At the southern end of the Morrison Formation in central Utah, a stunning vista of barren rocks is all that remains of a land once teeming with life. Here, during the late Jurassic, docile plant-eating dinosaurs grazed in herds, wary of the danger that nearby a hungry killer was on the loose. Predators were frightening, but this one was unusually vicious. A two-legged meat-eater, Allosaurus, was 40 feet long, and weighed up to two tons, but it was lightning swift. Armed with huge claws and sharp serrated teeth, Allosaurus was a prehistoric kickboxer with a lust for blood. One bleak summer, 148 million years ago, the rain stopped. Rivers ceased flowing. Stricken by drought, the verdant plains of central Utah began to dry up. Food was scarce, but water, the wellspring of life, was scarcer. All that remained were a few isolated pools of mud. One would become a death trap. Today, it's known as the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry. Here, scientists have exhumed over 10,000 dinosaur bones. But it's the tragic events surrounding one day of carnage the dinosaur detective Dale Russell of the North Carolina State University is trying to piece together. Well, this is where it began. 148 million years ago, a group of plant-eating dinosaurs looked in this direction when these sediments were being deposited, and it was a drought, and they saw a surface that was wet, and they walked down toward that surface, and it turned out to be mud. Mired in the mud, the plant eaters panicked. Lured to the scene by the frenzy, a large Allosaurus moved in for the kill. He charges across the mud surface and begins slaughtering those animals. And perhaps the plant eating dinosaurs struggled, perhaps they roared, perhaps they squealed, perhaps they defecated, uh, but it didn't do any good because they were fastened. Attracted by the roars of pain and the stench of death, other Allosaurs joined in the carnage. Within minutes, the mud was awash with blood and half-eaten carcasses. As the massacre reached a fever pitch, the meat eaters turned on each other. We have 13 huge plant-eating dinosaurs dead. We have six flesh-eating dinosaurs, passers-by to the scene, that were also caught in the death trap. And we have 44 Allosauruses, most of them half-grown, who were killed in the process of trying to compete for flesh in that trap. Since its discovery, the scene of the crime has been kept under wraps to preserve the bones of the dinosaurs that died on that fateful day. This is the arm and hand of an Allosaurus. It's larger than average, and you can see from my hand here that it's extremely powerfully constructed. This arm had claws that were shaped and formed so that the animal could hold onto the prey, not to cut its body. When the Allosaur grabbed its prey, 
These claws were simply to hold the animal. Its victim lies just three feet away, a 20-ton sauropod. Over here on this side of its pelvis, you can see these deep grooves that I'm cleaning here. They were all made by an Allosaurus who was actually breaking bone off of this pelvis. This tells us something about the power and the strength of Allosaurus. It was not a small animal. Allosaurus was the most vicious predator of its day. But its nasty nature may have been aggravated by a tough and miserable life. At the Museum of the Rockies in Montana, Rebecca Laws has been studying the skeleton of Big Al, the most complete Allosaurus ever found. Her findings may earn this beast a little sympathy. The kind of life this dinosaur had was probably very painful, given the number of infections in its feet and in its hand, um, the injuries in its rib cage, and other problems throughout its skeleton. Some of them were definitely injuries where the bone had been broken and rehealed, like on this rib here. And some of them were infections, like in the thumb bone of the right hand here. A closer look at the bones revealed still more abnormalities. Many were swollen and distended, while others were pitted or cracked. In all, she found a total of 19 injuries on Big Al's skeleton, everything from fractured ribs to a bone marrow infection. Osteomyelitis, a bone marrow infection, does occur in humans, and it is extremely painful. Um, this is the bone that was infected, as well as being broken and rehealed from its right hand, and this is the bone from its left hand, so you can see how inflamed it would have been. Allosaurs fought with their hands and feet. Any injury would have been torture. This type of injury to the toe, or the claw, rather, of Big Al, would have been like ripping your toenail off and trying to regenerate that or regrow that. And Big Al would have been in a significant amount of pain. The Jurassic was the age of giants and survivors. It was a brutal world of kill or be killed. But evolution was in overdrive. Diplodocus lumbered across the continent, whipping its tail faster than the speed of sound. Crocodiles dominated the waterways, and tiny amphibians eked out a meager living at the bottom of the food chain. But for some, like the battered Allosaurus and the armor-plated Stegosaurus, time was running out. After 60 million years, North America began to change. Sea levels were rising. The climate was heating up. Over time, familiar landscapes withered and disappeared. The Jurassic had spawned some of the strangest dinosaurs that ever lived. But the future looked bleak. The stars of the Jurassic had to evolve or die. Which was it to be? A hundred and twenty-five million years ago, a curtain descended on North America. A series of cataclysmic events was changing the face of the Earth. The world was passing from the Jurassic period into the Cretaceous. Before it was over, some of nature's greatest creations would vanish into oblivion. Gone were the legendary giants of the past, Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, and the long-necked sauropod Diplodocus. In the shifting sands of time, extinction would overwhelm them. But how and why? The violent upheavals that began 150 million years ago reached a peak in the Cretaceous. 
volcanoes exploded. Cracks in the Earth's crust widened on the ocean floor, unleashing a steady flow of molten lava that reduced the size of the ocean's basins and caused the sea level to rise. The rifting tore the continent of Laurasia apart, setting North America adrift. As sea levels continued to rise, the interior of North America sank. Gradually, water from the Arctic and the Gulf of Mexico poured in, creating a shallow inland sea, a thousand miles wide, that inundated a third of the continent. If we were to look at the environment during the early Cretaceous, 125 to 110 million years ago, we would see a semi-arid savanna. But as the seaway came in, along the margin of it, we developed a very wet, humid climate, very much like the Gulf Coast. The rise in sea level created a gulf that divided eastern North America from the west. But it also triggered an even more dramatic change, a complete shift in climate. North America woke to a paradise of lush forests and tropical jungles. Global temperatures had risen five degrees. In the warm, moist climate of the Cretaceous, plants and animals multiplied in record numbers. And new species began to appear. In the midst of a botanical revolution, the dinosaurs would witness something they'd never seen before. For the first time in the Earth's history, flowering plants blossomed in North America. In the hothouse of evolution, flowers changed the world. Paleobotanist Kirk Johnson of the Museum of Natural History in Denver, Colorado, is investigating the spread of flowering plants and their impact on the Cretaceous. Sometime around 125 million years ago, the first flowering plants appear. By 100 million years ago, they're very common in many different places in North America. And by the end of the Cretaceous, by 70 million years ago, flowering plants are the single most common element on the landscapes. Kirk sees a correlation between the rise of flowers and the fall of the Jurassic giants. Most of the dinosaur faunas are replaced by smaller bodied, larger headed animals, animals with elaborate chewing mechanisms in their jaws. Among them were the hadrosaurs, commonly known as duckbills because of the shape of their beaks. The largest were over 30 feet long and weighed three tons. But what set them apart was a mouthful of a thousand interlocking teeth. These animals share some interesting properties of their face and mouth that really have something to say about how they might have fed on plants. These late Cretaceous dinosaurs would grate the vegetation between batteries of teeth. So they had a lot of ways to process plants. Hadrosaurs were the most abundant dinosaurs in the world during the Cretaceous. In herds of up to 30,000, they trampled the plains of North America, leaving behind a trail of devastation. For dinosaurs traveling in vast herds, identification and communication can be a problem, but not for the hadrosaurs. From a distance, all duckbills looked alike. Closer up, the similarity ended. Some developed an amazing array of headgear. Lambiosaurus had a hatchet-shaped crest on the top of its skull. The crest of Corythosaurus covered its head like a helmet. Crested hadrosaurs ranged in length from 30 to 45 feet and weighed up to four tons. Adorned with spines and spikes and humps, these bizarre looking beasts may not have been the prettiest creatures around, but they certainly stood out in the crowd. The most famous was Parasaurolophus. Its crest was a horn-like tube, six feet long that curved backward from its head.
Parasaurolophus has puzzled scientists since it was found in 1920. Some thought its crest was a snorkel for underwater breathing, but its end is sealed, making breathing impossible. Others think there's more to it than meets the eye. At the New Mexico Museum of Natural History in Albuquerque, Tom Williamson has been trying to solve the mystery of what this massive crest was used for. When Parasaurolophus lived, New Mexico looked very much like this. It was basically a tropical, subtropical jungle. And so we think that these dinosaurs, like uh, Parasaurolophus, might have made sounds um, to communicate with each other because these sounds could penetrate through this thick, jungly uh, underbrush. These crests made very different sorts of sounds. They may have made sounds to help coordinate their movements, especially when they couldn't see each other. To test his theory, Tom needed to look inside the crest without damaging it, so he decided to run it through a CAT scan. This is the partial skull of a Parasaurolophus, one of these crested duckbilled dinosaurs. It's lying on its side. This is the eye socket, and this is the crest extending out from the skull roof back behind the head. And we want to see what the structure, the internal structure of this crest is like, what the labyrinth of tubes etc. inside of this crest looks like. The CAT scan produced hundreds of x-rays that, when assembled, created a detailed image of the crest. Inside were ten hollow chambers connected to the animal's nasal passages, suggesting Parasaurolophus may have used his crest to communicate with other duckbills. To find out, Tom enlisted the aid of computer scientist Carl Diegert of Sandia National Labs. Together, they modeled the crest on a high-performance computer to recreate the sound. The labyrinth of tubes and air cavities resembled those of a French horn. Now, 68 million years later, Parasaurolophus's call of the wild can be heard once again. The main pitch of his call is quite low. It's at 38 hertz. This is a pure version. So that, 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 that particular component of the sound roots this whole call. So again, that particular note, that uh, first octave D, is, is set basically by measuring uh, how long his main sinus passage was. The longest tube produced the main sound, and the shorter tubes produced higher notes. When resonating at the same time, it was a primeval symphony. It's quite a startling sound. It's, 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 um, it's, it's not something that people, at least this century, would build uh, musically. I like to say it sounds almost chaotic. It's nothing uh, that I've ever heard before, and it, it sent shivers up my spine. It was just so strange. The wilds of the late Cretaceous boomed with the song of Parasaurolophus. But another sound in the forest was far more terrifying. After 170 million years of dinosaur evolution, a killer had arrived unlike any the world had ever seen. Sixty-eight million years ago, on the rim of the inland sea in eastern Montana, nothing was safe. By the end of the Cretaceous, nature had finally perfected the most diabolical creature that ever lived. The pinnacle of dinosaur evolution, it was the ultimate big game hunter. During its reign of terror, rivals cowered in the presence of the awesome Tyrannosaurus Rex. T. 
T-Rex wasn't the largest dinosaur that ever lived, or the smartest, but it was big, it had keen senses, acute eyesight, and a body to die for. Its strength was in its legs. The bones were unusually massive to support a battery of muscles. Its thighs were as thick as telephone poles, but its legs were lean, designed for running. To offset the weight of its head, its tail was 20 feet long, composed of a half ton of sinew. Tail and head in perfect balance, T-Rex could outrun an Olympic sprinter. But its most impressive feature was a jaw full of teeth that could bite through a car. Now look at what I call the Ruttweiler effect. The back of the head where the jaw muscles are, it's incredibly wide. The jaw muscles would bulge out like this. And if you were a T-Rex and you flexed your jaws, you can feel these huge humps of contractile tissue going up and down. You could kill with one bite any animal in your ecosystem. And then you have the anti-tank gun. Right here, you have teeth. These are not sharp teeth. They're shaped like a projectile to go through armor. These are designed not to cut rotting, putrefied flesh. These are designed to go through the backbone. But up front, something totally different. It's got closely spaced nipping teeth for taking the bits of flesh off a bone or for doing something else Animals today with close space nippers in the front groom. What was T-Rex grooming? They were grooming each other. That was social bonding. Back at Fort Peck in eastern Montana, Keith Rigby's excavation is nearing its end for the season. But the fossils keep coming. Once they're out of the ground, the bones are wrapped in bandages, then coated in plaster for safekeeping. Okay. Oh. All right. While it may be years before they're fully examined, Rigby's finds are already adding weight to the exciting theory that Tyrannosaurus rex was a caring parent. His discovery of both predator and prey at Fort Peck is also intriguing scientists. This uh, particular site is unusual in that it preserves both the predator, T-Rex, and associated carnivorous dinosaurs, but the prey as well. That would include duckbill dinosaurs or hadrosaurs with the T-Rex. Maybe the carnivores, the predators, would actually remove large pieces of carcass back to a central place and feed the young or to otherwise save and protect uh, in a much more organized social structure than we give them credit before. Essentially, they went out uh, for take-home pizza or a sack of ribs or something and then brought them home and we're now finding the leftovers of that meal or many meals, perhaps. Rigby's views are supported by South Dakota dinosaur hunter Pete Larson of the Black Hills Institute, who also discovered a family of T-Rexes. We found multiple burials of T-Rex. Sue the T-Rex, the most famous of all of them, which we collected back in 1990, was found with the remains of a smaller male, a juvenile T-Rex with a skull about 18 inches long, and a baby T-Rex whose skull was only about 10 inches in length. It would be a real advantage to act as a family unit. When you have a cooperative family, you can probably do a lot more things. You can, you can feed yourselves. You know, these guys have to eat every day. T-Rex actually probably ha was monogamous in their relationship with their mate. Uh, the females were larger than the males. The, the, uh, 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 they, they formed family groups. The young would stay with the, with, the, with the adults for a while, learning how to hunt and, 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 and uh, actually forming a pack in order to, to be more effective. The image of T-Rex as a faithful husband and father conflicts with the traditional view. 
Early in the century, Hollywood's version of the tyrant lizard was a bachelor with a bad temper and a mean streak. A solitary tyrannosaur would have been terrifying. A pack of them would have been lethal. We have footprints from giant meat-eating dinosaurs, and they're not solitary. They're in twos or threes. I'm a T-Rex, my mate's over there. I go this side, she goes that side. We converge, and if we reach a consensus that we can kill that triceratops, or that duck bill, then we run. I've got the tallest, most powerful legs of any animal in my system. I can catch anything. And now you have two or three T-Rexes coming out a, at a vulnerable member of the herd, and then we kill. Tyrannosaurus rex was the undisputed king of the Cretaceous, the master of its domain. But its reign would be brief. As the last generation cast an eye over the North American landscape, it couldn't know the end was near. Sixty-five million years ago, dinosaurs disappeared from the fossil record. Their death marked the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. Between the two is a layer of sediment called the KT boundary. It's easy to identify because it contains iridium, a rare mineral associated with comets. In 1978, an oil company geologist spotted a crater off the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Two-thirds of a mile below sea level and 120 miles across, it was massive. Core samples later confirmed it was rich in iridium. In 1980, scientists at the University of California in Berkeley linked iridium to an object from space and the extinction of the dinosaurs. One fateful day, 65 million years ago, a massive comet entered our solar system six miles across and weighing a trillion tons, it hurtled towards the Earth at 50,000 miles per hour. As it burst through the atmosphere, the dinosaurs would have seen a huge fireball with a shimmering tail. Next was an ear-shattering sonic boom. Exploded with the force of 100 million hydrogen bombs. The Yucatan was the worst place on Earth for the comet to hit. A rare combination of minerals in the rock produced a huge fireball followed by acid rain. The dinosaurs that survived the impact were living on borrowed time. A cloud of sulfur and carbon dioxide soon plunged the globe into a nuclear winter. Temperatures suddenly dropped, vegetation withered, and food became scarce. Unable to adapt to dramatic change, the dinosaurs perished and the earth fell silent. This is only one scenario. Over a hundred theories have been proposed. A killer from outer space grips the imagination. But many paleontologists now believe it doesn't tell the whole story of why the dinosaurs died. The single extraterrestrial impact does not create the pattern of extinction that we see in the rocks here in Montana. It doesn't seem to fit what the rocks are telling us, whispering to us after 65 million years as to the real cause of their extinction. My understanding of dinosaurs is that they may have been dwindling and becoming geographically restricted and somewhat stressed. And perhaps the asteroid that evidently occurred, impact that occurred 65 million years ago, was merely the last straw. I think what we have here is physical evidence for a giant asteroid and biologic evidence for extinction. 
For me, it's a cause and effect relationship. I think the asteroid killed the dinosaurs. We have things like the plants actually changing as we reach the end of the Cretaceous. There's quite a different turnover in foliage, and some people have speculated that perhaps this, the, the dinosaurs eating this, this new foliage were not able to digest it properly, and they actually uh, gassed themselves to death, or in some instances literally blew up. The dinosaurs are gone, but their legacy lives on. New finds around the world suggest that somewhere in a primeval forest, a tiny two-footed predator emerged with something new, a feathered wing. With some of the most remarkable dinosaurs that ever lived, North America was the real Jurassic Park. Not all of the dinosaurs survived the harsh cruelties of the prehistoric world. As the landscape changed, so did they. But, just as time was about to run out for them, evolution produced the most magnificent dinosaur of all, 